Hello, uh, welcome to the talk. Scaling open source big data cloud applications is easy slash hard. I'm Paul Brebner. I'm the InstaCluster technology evangelist. And I should just apologize in advance. I lost my week, my voice a week ago, and it's only back about 30%. So I hope the talk is not too painful to listen to as a result. So who am I? Um, I spent several decades in R&D and distributed systems and performance engineering. Uh, for the last five years, I've been the open source technology evangelist for InstaCluster based in Canberra. And I've been learning lots of new open source technologies such as Apache Cassandra, Spark, Kafka, Zookeeper, and lots more. Um, and this talk is actually based on a chapter in a book called uh, 97 Things Every Data Engineer Should Know that was published last year by O'Reilly. And the chapter was called The Yin and Yang of Big Data Scalability. So an overview of what I'm going to be talking about. Scaling is easy, but sometimes there are some complications. And the three examples I'll be talking about today are Cassandra auto-scaling, a, a non-read detection example, and the Kafka partitions problem. So just a bit of background, InstaCluster provides a managed platform, um, a cloud platform for big data open source technologies, including uh, storage, streaming, analysis, search, and orchestration. That was the latest addition to our platform, uh, Uber's cadence for a workflow orchestration. And we provide this um, across multiple cloud providers and lots of extra enterprise features, uh, particularly security and maintenance and backups and things that aren't necessarily part of the um, default open source software. And this talk focuses on Cassandra and Kafka specifically. So first of all, scaling is easy, particularly for Cassandra and Kafka. Why? Well, they've actually been designed to provide uh, linear horizontal scalability on commodity hardware. Uh, Cassandra, for example, is just a ring architecture. You can add nodes to get increased uh, scalability, and it's really easy to do. But actually, there are lots of moving parts in any real systems. So there are some complications, including data centers, racks, nodes, partitions, replication factor, and time for auto-scaling. Uh, Cassandra works by having a petition key, and uh, the petition is an important part of the Cassandra architecture, and so does Kafka, which we'll have a look at in a while as well. So the first example is Cassandra auto-scaling. So there are two ways of resizing Cassandra clusters. Uh, the first is horizontal scaling. Uh, you can add nodes without interruption, but you can only scale up, not down. It takes time and puts extra load on the cluster as data streams to extra nodes. Second approach is vertical scaling. Uh, you can replace nodes with bigger or smaller node types with more or less cores. You can scale up and down. And again, it takes time. There's a temporary, and there's there's a temporary reduction in the capacity of the cluster as you do the the um, resizing. Uh, you have a choice of how many nodes are replaced concurrently. A node essentially means you only replace one node at a time, or by rack means you can replace all of the nodes in a rack at a time, or you can choose something in between as well. So we did some experiments with uh, cluster resizing, and here are two uh, graphs showing the difference in total time to replace by node on the left-hand side, by rack on the right-hand side. I'll be using the same Cassandra cluster example through all of this um, talk. Uh, this cluster has six nodes in three racks with two nodes per rack. As you can see on the left-hand side, it took about 47 um, minutes to do the resize by node. On the right, um, replace, re resizing by rack is a lot quicker and takes about 20 minutes. 
Here's a graph um, which you'll see a few times in a few variations. It shows time on the x-axis and on the um, the the y-axis. Uh, it shows the um, the cluster capacity. So this graph shows resizing by node first of all. You'll see that the capacity is reduced by one sixth of the total um, each resize operation. And this is a very simplified model as well. Um, so the dotted, dotted uh, yellow line there shows the capacity um, of the cluster as a result of the first um, node resize. And the capacity eventually hits the dotted green line, which is 200%, which is double the original um, cluster capacity. So the other graph is showing resize by rack. And you'll see that the capacity is reduced by two sixths of the total node each resize operation here. So you get a bigger reduction in the um, capacity of the cluster during resize, but it is done faster. And this next graph shows the comparison of both resize by rack and by node. Resize by rack is um, faster, it has a bigger capacity hit during the resize. So there's a bit of a trade off depending on which one you pick to, to try. So some general observations. If the capacity during resize is exceeded, then latencies will increase significantly. Um, but even if there is sufficient capacity, the latencies will increase in, during the resize due to the way that Cassandra load balancing works, which assumes equal sized nodes. So it can't actually do the load balancing perfectly while it's got unequal sized nodes during the resize. Um, resizing by node, more nodes in the cluster reduces the impact of reduced cluster capacity during resizing. And some, capac some clusters have hundreds of nodes, but it will take a lot longer as a result. Uh, however, looking at our cluster statistics, I did notice that many of our customers have um, six or less nodes. So it's actually a realistic problem that customers care about um, the six node cluster example that I have used. So this shows a model of latency increasing during a resize. Um, I started out with an initial load on the cluster of 60%, which increases during the resize operation slightly. Um, so this graph shows resize by node versus um, by zone, uh, showing initially the cluster utilization and number of cores. So the cluster utilization um, is the top two lines and the number of cores is the bottom two lines, which shows that um, as the number of cores increase uh, you do eventually get an increase, a decrease in the utilization, but there is a spike of the utilization initially. Uh, and this shows specifically the latency. Um, this shows the latency increase during resize by node. Uh, there's two uh, lines of interest here. The green color is the average cluster latency, which you'll see um, spikes a bit and then drops off eventually. Uh, improving, in fact, as the capacity of the cluster um, is doubled. However, it's the blue line, which is potentially the problem, uh, which shows the maximum latency on the worst case node in the cluster. And you'll see that that spikes quite significantly towards the end and then finally drops off as well. And the same graph showing resize by zone uh, against, again, the average cluster latency is the yellow line and it's the orange one which is the worry there's a big spike um, towards the end of the resize operation on one of the nodes. And in the comparison again, uh, this basically shows that the, um, the maximum latency uh, with resize by zone is quite a bit more than resizing by node. So that's something just to watch out for potentially. So let's try some auto scaling. Now auto scaling isn't something that um, Cassandra typically does, it's something that we've added to our managed service um, and it's quite tricky to get right. So what happens is as the load increases, you need to decide when to trigger a resize and what type of resize operation to trigger. I did some experiments, so this isn't part of our core managed service, but I did this um, sort of as a demonstration application 
see how well our API actually worked for auto scaling. So I automated auto scaling using instant clusters monitoring and provisioning APIs in conjunction with each other. Uh, Prometheus and some rules that I came up with, a linear regression to do some prediction. And this example does ignore what we just talked about, which is the, the latency aspect. So here's a simple example of uh, an auto scaling model as there's an increasing load on the system. Um, up on the left hand side there, the solid line, it's going up and we're worried it might hit the 100% mark at some point in the future. We wanna know when that might happen. So we apply some linear regression, which is a dotted line over an hour of real data extrapolated into the future. And we predict that the cluster will reach 100% capacity around the 280 minute mark, which is 220 minutes in the future. So there's two options, resize by rack or by node. Um, you need to do the initiation in time to prevent overloading during the resize operation. So this shows the two examples or the two different approaches, resize by rack must be initiated sooner compared with resize by node, as it has less capacity during the resize, so 67% compared with 83% of the initial capacity. So the auto scaling proof of concept did work okay. Um, we used the monitoring API to get data from Cassandra, um, Prometheus, uh, plus the linear regression and some rules that I came up with, which then used the provisioning API to uh, initiate the correct size, um, the correct type of resize. And the rules were generalized to allow for scaling up and down um, and resizing by any number of nodes currently up to the maximum rack size. So the next example is anomaly detection. So in historical curiosity, there was one woman in the Apollo 11 mission control room, quite a critical role she had, I believe, as well. So we built an anomaly detection system a few years ago out of multiple technologies, particularly Kafka, Cassandra, and Kubernetes. Um, it was designed for massively scalable anomaly detection. Um, the system basically allowed you to inject events into the system with some Kafka producers. That's on the left-hand side with the transaction generator. Um, the Kafka cluster handled um, uh, temporary storage of necessary of those events and then calling Kafka consumers, which did the event processing pipeline or the anomaly detection pipeline, which was actually divided up into two parts eventually. Uh, that was all running in Kubernetes and the detection pipeline also interacted with Cassandra. It stored the events into Cassandra and then in order to run the anomaly detection algorithm, it had to retrieve a significant number of events each time um, and run the detection algorithm on those events and then come to a conclusion about whether there was an anomaly or not. So initially I thought, well, this is really easy. Um, all you have to do to scale the system is increase the hardware resources, which because we're using Cassandra and Kafka was, was actually really trivial to do. Um, there were some tuning knobs in the system uh, essentially, the orange hardware knobs were the ones that were easy to um, to increase initially, but there were also some software tuning knobs, which were the yellow ones in this diagram. Uh, the system was quite big eventually. It could have been bigger. We just stopped at an arbitrary point when we got some good numbers, 574 cores in total. Um, uh, Cassandra by far had the biggest number of cores, followed by Kubernetes and then Kafka last. So initially, when we just tried increasing hardware resources without tuning anything else, scalability wasn't actually all that good. We got about um, uh, 7.5 billion anomaly checks a day out of the system. But as you can see from this line, it's far from straight. It starts dropping off significantly. Tuning, uh, tuning was required in order to get better results. And better, sca better scalability post-tuning achieved 19 billion uh, checks a day, as this graph shows, which is the orange line there. And it was pretty close to uh, linearly scalable eventually after all the tuning had been done. 
uh, what did we have to tune? Well, essentially, we had to optimize some of the software resources, which I've emphasized in this diagram with the red arrows. First, we had to minimize the number of Kafka consumers, which is the first thread pool uh, that we had. Uh, and second, we had to minimize the number of Cassandra connections. And third, we had to maximize the number of Cassandra client um, threads or the concurrency in the Cassandra client thread pool, which was the second thread pool that we set up. Okay, so what's really going on behind the Kafka partitions? This is a third example. Um, so Kafka topic partitions enable consumer concurrency. Um, consumers basically enable work to be shared within consumer groups. So you can have multiple consumers in the same group. And this is the architecture of how uh, the Kafka consumers and petitions actually works a bit under the covers. Um, for Kafka read scalability, multiple messages can be read concurrently from the leaders of multiple petitions and brokers. Uh, and basically you need more petitions or greater and e or equal to um, the number of consumers in terms of the petition. So if you've got say 100 um, consumers, you need more than 100 petitions for the system to work well. So some systems have high consumer or petition fan out. Uh, this can be caused by at least two things. First, by design, you may just have a design that has many topics and many consumers. However, in a lot of systems, it's actually caused by another problem, which is slow consumers. Slow consumers actually um, need, mean that you need more consumers uh, or more concurrency, in fact, to increase throughput. Um, if you've heard of Little's Law, this is a pretty good explanation of how it's, how it's all working. So concurrency is equal to the throughput times the response time. And if you rearrange that formula, you get throughput equals concurrency divided by the response time. And in Kafka, concurrency is just the number of consumers, basically. So as resp response time goes up, you need to increase the number of Kafka consumers. So at that level, consumer scalability is easy, but on the right side of the Kafka architecture, there is another complication. So this is how Kafka works in terms of right scalability. Multiple messages can be written concurrently using multiple petitions on different brokers. Um, Kafka basically works by allowing replication between the um, the leaders and the followers of the petitions. And we did some experiments to see what was going on there. So benchmarking reveals that um, if you only have a replication factor of one, that is that it's only the leader of each petition that's getting um, the events, then you can actually have almost an arbitrary number of petitions. This is the orange line in this graph. So there's no drop in throughput with increased petitions. But obviously something's going on if you uh, increase the replication factor to three, which is quite commonly used in enterprise systems, make sure you have enough redundancy across the, the Kafka cluster. Then throughput actually starts dropping quite significantly um, above about um, 20 or 30 petitions and heads downwards significantly as you um, increase it over a thousand. So what are the implications in terms of scaling Kafka systems because of this? Well, um, you need bigger clusters potentially with more petitions, um, clusters with more nodes or bigger nodes. Um, you need to design your system to, to minimize the number of topics and consumers if possible. Uh, you need to optimize your consumers for minimum time. And you really need to benchmark any application um, with many petitions to see whether it will actually work um, at the required concurrency levels. And should you blame the Apache Zookeeper? Or maybe Zookeeper, Zookeeper is responsible for control in the Kafka cluster. Uh, from version three, it's being replaced by a native K raft protocol, which uh, isn't quite production ready yet. So we don't offer that, but we are doing some experiments uh, at the moment on it. And this, in theory, may enable more petitions, absolutely, in a cluster, but may or may not impact the throughput. Um, 
So we're currently doing some benchmarking uh, in our lab at the moment, and we've got a talk accepted at ApacheCon USA in October on benchmarking Zookeeper versus KRAFT, which should um, hopefully be useful to people that are interested in uh, the pros and cons of um, the two different Kafka modes. Oh, now, in the abstract for this talk, I did promise a fourth example, which is a Kafka Connect data pipeline one that I've been uh, talking about at a few conferences over the last year. Um, this is an interesting example. It involves quite a few different systems all connected together um, and op open source or, or publicly available uh, title data. Um, so it's sort of a, an IoT use case with some visualization options as well. Um, so it's quite an interesting problem. Um, as it turned out, lots of things can go wrong, uh, not just performance and scalability, but also reliability and other things. But they do all interact in interesting ways, which makes it a tricky problem. Um, if you check out my blogs, and the URL is on the next slide, um, and look, look at the pipeline series, you'll find some insights into scalability of Kafka Connect um, data pipeline systems as well. So scaling is mostly easy. Um, we've seen that um, it's possible to do scaling um, using scalable open source big data technologies um, hosted by suitable cloud providers uh, with suitable monitoring, understanding of auto scaling, how different software knobs interact and by scaling systems incrementally. So that's all for me for this talk. Thanks very much. Uh, for listening. Um, there's the URL for my blogs. Uh, I've been um, building open source demo applications for the last five years. There's a lot of blogs there about lots of technologies, not just Apache technologies, but other open source technologies as well. Um, if you've got any questions, maybe the easiest way to contact me is via LinkedIn, and I'll try and answer any questions. Uh, that you send. So thank you very much. That's all from me. And goodbye.